that friends and colleagues who are joining us online are, are with us at this point. We've been uh, chatting about uh, art and culture and uh, what happens uh, in communities. Um, we're really privileged tonight to have a, a group of um, artists and art professionals who um, have worked in communities to uh, help transform them uh, around uh, art and culture and uh, the impacts that those have on uh, economic development and uh, neighborhood cohesion. Um, and so uh, for those who don't know, this is the open classroom. Uh, my name is Ted Landsmark. I am the director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center on Urban and Regional Policy. And uh, this semester, we've been looking at uh, the way design um, has positive impacts on our communities. And we've been doing this uh, in conjunction with my colleague, Anne-Marie Lubinow uh, from the Rudy Bruno Foundation. And so I'm gonna turn the screen over to Anne-Marie. You're on. Thank you, Ted. As Ted mentioned, my name's Anne-Marie Lubinow and I'm the director of the Rudy Bruner Award for Urban Excellence at the Bruner Foundation. And for those of you who don't know about us, the Rudy Bruner Award is a national urban design award that recognizes transformative places that contribute to the economic, environmental, and social vitality of American cities. And we are pleased to be partnering with Northeastern University to offer the Inspiring Design series. And one of the many delightful aspects of planning this series and organizing this series has been the opportunity to bring together people involved in urban design and development uh, initiatives and projects from across America, including our 88 Rudy Bruner Award medalists. Tonight, as Ted mentioned, we're going to focus on the role of arts and cultural organizations as community builders, civic leaders, and catalysts for change. We brought together five panelists with deep experience in the arts, activism, and urban development to share their insight. We're gonna learn about Yerba Buena Gardens, the 1999 Rudy Bruner Award gold medalist in San Francisco the redevelopment of several downtown blocks into a culture, cultural district that hosts arts organizations, a convention center and hotel, mixed income housing and extensive public gardens. And we'll consider how lessons learned from its development and ongoing evolution are informing current arts-based initiatives and projects in San Francisco, Santa Fe, New Mexico and Boston. And tonight we're continuing to partner with the Boston Society of Architects and Boston Society of Landscape Architects to offer continuing education credits. Please use the link that Kylie will put in the chat box to submit your information. So tonight's panelists, I'm really excited to be um, able to introduce, include Daniel Hernandez, who's the founder of Proyecto, a real estate advisory firm based in California. He's a real estate developer, planner, and project manager with over 25 years of experience in the development of large scale sites, neighborhoods, mixed use projects, and educational and cultural facilities. Previously, Daniel served as deputy commissioner for the New York City Department of Housing Preservation Development and managing director for the Jonathan Rose Companies. He was also a 1998 Harvard Loeb Fellow. Deborah Cullinan is the chief executive officer of Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Created as a cultural anchor of San Francisco's Yerba Buena Gardens neighborhood, the organization's work spans the realms of contemporary art, performance, film, civic engagement, and public life. Deborah is one of the nation's leading thinkers on the pivotal role of artists and arts organizations and what they play in shaping our social and political landscape. And at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, she's launched new programs, engagement strategies, and civic coalitions. She's a member of the California Governor's Task Force on Business and Jobs Recovery. Jamie Blosser is the Executive Director of the Santa Fe Art Institute in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Santa Fe Art Institute is an independent arts organization forging critical inquiry and cultural exchange among artists, creative practitioners, and the broader community. An architect, Jamie has based her practice on issues of equity, resilience, and participatory processes, which has included work with Native American tribes. Jamie was a 2015 Harvard Loeb Fellow and served as the AIA delegate for the 2016 UN Habitat Convening in Quito. And joining us from Boston today, we've had Kara Elliott Ortega, who's the city of Boston's chief of arts and culture, an urban planner. She focuses on the role of arts and creativity in the built environment and community development. Her work to implement Boston Creates, the city's 10-year cultural plan includes creating new resources for local artists, 
development of a public art program and supporting the development of cultural facilities. And Amari Paris Jeffries is the executive director of King Boston. King Boston is a privately funded nonprofit working closely with the city of Boston to create a new memorial and programs about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King and their time and work together in Boston. A longtime nonprofit profit executive and community leader, Amari brings a wealth of experience from nonprofit management, community activism, education reform, and social justice. So today, as on as with other sessions, we'll begin with brief presentations by the panelists, followed by the respondents, and then turn to Q audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A box to submit your questions. And we, as always, look forward to an engaging conversation. So I'm going to turn this over to Deborah. I'm sorry, not to Deborah. Daniel, so sorry. <laughs> I am putting on share now, uh, share screen now. So uh, hopefully we'll, the slides will open up soon. Do you see them yet or is it? Yes? Looks good. Great. So um, I am going to introduce the discussion by basically providing sort of the, the framework for how we might think about the intersection of arts, culture, community um, in creating inspiring design. Um, and I want to sort of bring us to some great places that we know around our country that are really pivotal in the way that there's the, the synergy between these amazingly active, wonderful places where culture, people come together, and basically our civilization, our society evolves by the exchange of information and the exchange of our histories together when we create these great public forums. And in this one, sitting in Bryant Park, it's actually adjacent to one of the most famous landmarks in our country, arts, education, cultural landmarks, the New York City Library. You go across the country to the Watts Towers, a place that has much memory, um, particularly the 1965 riots. That was uh, one of the only places in that neighborhood that was protected um, because of its memory, of its beauty that the artist, the sculpture, sculptor brought to that place. Um, and the importance of memory that this place in Watts Towers uh, today with thousands of visitors each year. And then the more recent um, innovations um, at Millennial Park in Chicago, uh, where artists actually played a huge role in creating art and sculpture that activated the place where people were engaging with art um, as a result of the thinking and the ways that artists think um, that's much different than, than you know, uh, the typical architect or developer might think about activating and engaging people in public space. So these places hold memories. Some of them are recent memories that are being created now, but they all are beginning to or, or had have a history of holding memories. And memories have value. And when I talk about value, you're sort of a, you know, a single bottom line developer thinking about value. Yes, it has economic value, but I think today, and probably the people who are listening in and are participating in this conversation, we think of value much deeper, meaning its memories are valuable. They're people-centered. They are places where people want to be because they have memory and that resonates with people. And so how do we think about creating those things, those places and designing them? And I want to make clear also in this presentation that we're not talking about fabricated memories. Um, we're talking about the authenticity of memory of place because people lived and occupied this land in these places before development happened. And so again, it's not about fabricating memory or fabricating value and memories. It's really thinking about what was there before we all arrived. This is Solvang, California. It happens to be where I live. It's a place that I love actually but it is a fabricated environment. Um, the Danes actually moved here in the late 1800s from Minnesota in search of, a, of an agriculture region where they could, um, where there were longer months um, for farming. And they settled into Santa Ynez Valley. Um, but what's interesting about the history of, of Solvang is that basically uh, in the 1920s, they decided to um, begin pasting architectural elements that created a sense of a Danish village. Um, and that was their history, and that was their memory. Um, but it also uh, led to uh, thinking about the Spanish colonialism uh, as a, in a romantic way. 
um, and it basically erased memories of Mexicans being in this area when California was not California, but was Mexico and before the border um, was created, that created California. And it definitely um, marginalizes the Chumash tribe, the indigenous peoples that were here before. Um, while they're powerful and present, their participation in day-to-day -day life and solving is marginalized. So again, it's not about fabricating memory, it's about being inclusive about memory and, and how we might use those to think about the built environment. This, um, I, I pull up this slide because most of the people on this presentation and part the participants here know what sustainable development is. We know that the most valuable places that have been using this rubric, equity, economy, and environment, try to place based these, these elements of sustainable development. And this chart shows culture in it because it is a way for us to recognize the intersections between all these four elements of sustainable development, but it begins to acknowledge that land has a history and it has memory. And in my work, um, the most exciting places and the most exciting projects I've been able to work on have included artists, arts and, um, uh, arts and cultural organizations and communities with a strong cultural heritage that bring their knowledge in the ways that we solve for equity, economy, environment, and culture in creating places where people wanna be. So again, this is about where people wanna be. This is about creating, um, uh, developing design that, that resonates with people, that holds memory um, where people can exchange ideas. So I'm gonna turn it over to Deborah first, um, who is located in San Francisco in a wonderful district south of Market. Um, and she's, uh, and I've known Deborah for a long time and I know her commitment to community um, and the work, the amazing work that she's done in the South of Market area in New River Glen and Gardens. And then Jamie Blossom will be presenting the Midtown District, a project that I'm also very familiar with and working on with Jamie um, that is still evolving. It's, uh, it's just beginning to be developed, but it is also on a piece of land with lots of memory. Both of these places have lots of memory. Both of them have tensions and winds um, and some of, and victories, uh, but some struggles along the way as well. And I'm sure Deborah and Jamie will touch on those as we move forward. So Deborah, I'll turn it over to you. I'll take, uh, remove my stop share. Thank you, Daniel. That was a terrific way yeah. to get us started. Um, I'm going to go to my share screen and get us going. How is that looking for everybody? Great. Great. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you so much for uh, including me, um, as was mentioned, I'm the CEO of Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, which is a piece of the collection of things that make up Yerba Buena Gardens. I'm also the vice chair of the board of the Yerba Buena Gardens Conservancy. So kind of give you a sense of where I'm coming from with this. And I'm gonna take you on a whirlwind tour of the, um, the founding of uh, Yerba Buena Gardens and also the evolution of uh, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, otherwise known as YBCA. So welcome to the Bay Area. Um, now I'm having this issue that I had before. There we go. So, so the important thing I think always to this point about places hold memory and memories have value, which is such a beautiful way of putting it, is that we are on land um, and that land does not belong to us. And in order for us to understand how to evolve, we have to make visible um, where we come from. And so right here is an image um, of uh, a beautiful piece that reflects on the history of Yerba Buena Gardens and acknowledges that it is the land of the Ohlone Ramitush people. And so the very beginning starts there. From there, um, we go, we fast forward to really what was decades of conversation, of struggle, of strife, there were lawsuits and there was displacement. And all of this was rooted in a desire to reimagine a key part of downtown San Francisco. Um, what is known is that in 1976, after lots of conversations, people couldn't agree, um, all kinds of, uh, of um, uh, conversations about what this project the, that is now known as Yerba Buena Garden should be, Mayor, then Mayor George Moscone really embraced a vision to combine the construction of a new convention center with this idea of a cultural district and the creation of public gardens in a city that really doesn't have a, a, a lot of open green space. 
Um, he, the, the, the myth of the story is that he selected a key group of people that represented communities and cross sectors. He put them all in a hotel room and he said, let's figure this out. Um, what resulted was Yerba Buena Gardens, founded in 1993 and still a work in progress. Um, to give you a sense of what it was before the site, um, it was parking lots um, and what was considered to be blight, but it also included a significant Filipino community and a significant uh, housing or community of people who were housed, specifically elderly people. This shows you an angle at third in mission. This shows you, this is Janet Delaney, the, the amazing photographer. This shows you an afternoon in 1981. This is Langston Street, which I'll show you, give you a sense of what this looks like today, also 1981. And this was the plan. So four decades later, thanks to the determination of what was then the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency, community advocates, committed developers, old and new arts institutions and a bunch of stakeholders, uh, we were able to begin to understand what it would look like to create a synergistic set of assets on a number of city blocks that would all tie together in order to create a new kind of urban space that was inclusive. So this begins to show you the before and the after. A parking lot becomes gardens, a fountain and a memorial uh, is, is now one of the most iconic and, and highly visited places in the city of San Francisco. The Leroy King Carousel, which is at the Children's Creativity Museum. Um, we have a children's play area. This aerial view shows you what it looks, what the children's block and the esplanade um, look like today. So hopefully you're getting a brief sense of the before and the after. Um, we have a festival that programs the gardens all summer long. You can go outside on almost any day at lunchtime for a concert or a performance. The children's play circle is populated. We have uh, in the gardens, we have an active uh, child care development center. Um, we have uh, the, the carousel, the creativity museum and all of these amenities around it. And we also have um, a beautiful array of public art that serves not only to ground you and where you are, but also to guide you and provide some wayfinding through the experience. So again, salsa dancing, circus on the Esplanade, Yerba Buena Gardens Festival musicians performing. And then that brings us to Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. And so I'll focus just the last of my presentation there to talk really about the role of the arts in really imagining um, neighborhood and inclusive change in community. Um, our organization is shifting power to artists working in service of their communities to advance equity, health, and well being. We have a theater building, a 750 seat theater, and we also have a building known as the Forum, um, which includes a large black box, gallery spaces, a beautiful lobby, a film screening room. And with these two, um, physical buildings and the gardens and the surrounding area, we see ourselves as a civic institution that's in contributing particularly today to the reawakening of a beautiful neighborhood. We focus on four vital conditions um, of community health and well-being. These build on what we know of as the social determinants of health. These are the four vital conditions that we believe artists are essential to, um, social cohesion and belonging, community safety, civic engagement, and community identity or community narrative, which I think goes back to what Daniel was saying about places holding memory and authentic memory and community and how important it is that we lift and make visible that authentic memory in community if we're gonna reimagine our cities. We believe the communities are the best designers of, the, of their own systems and futures. Artists are central to this work and this is our job. Um, at YBCA, we've moved from being a, a, a sort of transactional place that is only about the presentation of artistic work and really more toward becoming a public square to taking the ethos of the gardens and the community around us and bringing that ethos inside, thinking about what does it mean to actually create 
an ongoing dynamic public square where we're bringing artists into connection with one another and with the public, not only around the artistic product, but really around the process and opening up that process of inquiry into the community in order to reimagine who we are. Um, we have three areas of program. YBCA Create is our new um, thoroughly integrated interdisciplinary structure, which really focuses on artist residencies and artists spending time, deep time with us and our community. YBCA Champion is really about advocating for the role that the arts play in advancing the health and well being of our communities and ensuring that artists are equipped and at the table to be part of the, those conversations and to be driving us forward. And YBCA Invest, which is really looking at new models of investment in the arts and imagining how to rethink the systems of support that we've created. An example of that right now is we launched recently a guaranteed income pilot project for artists with uh, San Francisco's Mayor Mayor London Breed. Uh, the first, as far as we know, pilot that's focusing on economic security in the form of guaranteed income specifically for artists. So it gives you a sense of how we're developing an ecosystem. We're thinking about how we emphasize the process and we create the conditions for artists to do their work. We champion that work and then we find new ways to invest in that work. Um, not only are we engaged in the gardens and in our own center, we are, we are also actively animating around the city. This is an example um, of uh, 130 murals that we uh, participated or supported in the creation of through an organization called Paint the Void, 130 murals since the pandemic and shelter in place that have been peppered throughout the city in order to bring joy and inspiration, to regain public trust and to spread health messaging uh, as we move forward. Um, this is an example of taking that work outside of the building, turning the building outward. So this is our plaza this is a, a piece um, by Caleb Duarte called The Monument as Living Memory. And over the course of the past six months and moving forward, this is a dynamic changing piece of art that people can engage with over time. So it's not one piece of static work, it's always in process and it's engaging directly with the communities around us. Um, this is an, a, a choreographer named Alice Shepard. Uh, Alice is working with us in deep residency. And the reason why I wanted to share that with you is as we think about the way we make cities and the way we make places, I think we can think about the way we embed artists deeply into that work to help us reimagine. So Alice is not only someone that we're working with in, in the form of a commission and presentation, Alice and her company, and as you can see, she's a, a choreographer in a wheelchair, um, she is, uh, every time she is commissioned by an arts institution, she is being paid, maybe not always so much, but being paid to do the work of the commission, but she is essentially providing pro bono accessibility consultation to ensure that the institution is as, as accessible as possible to the people in her community. And what we're interested in here is what happens when you understand that when you work with an artist, you are transformed. And it isn't that you put an exhibition or a performance up then you put it down and you go back to a neutral state. Each time you work with that artist, they've guided you in a new direction and they've helped you transform. And so working with Alice in this way is really about that. How do we, how do we assure that we don't return, but that we progress? Um, and this is one more example of how we're doing this. Meet our, our newly announced YBCA 10 um, these are 10 artists who we are, have brought into deep fellowship who will work with us over the next year at least. They are all focused on economic um, and racial justice, uh, climate and racial justice, sorry, economic justice sort of fits in all over the place there. Um, and the idea here is that we're going to create the conditions for them to work in our environment and to activate the environment as a public square to create experiments and prototypes that we can then put out into the city, into the streets, into the gardens. Um, so thinking of ourselves less as a place of presentation and passive witness and more as a pace of incubation, a laboratory for what is possible. And I think I'll, I'll wind down there um, and pass it along. I can't remember who's next. That is me. Thank you so much, Deborah. And um, yeah, your, your organization, your Rubuena Center is just such a model 
And um, I wasn't joking when I said I just wanted to mind meld with you for a few hours. <laughs> so thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully you can see that. Great, thank you. So I'm, I'm just going to start also, I, I love how we're all starting with the acknowledgement of the land that seems so critical. And um, I'm going to present an abbreviated version of a land acknowledgement um, that's been recently developed um, by one of our partners as part of the project I'm about to discuss. This place we now call Santa, call Santa Fe is still recognized as Ogopoge, which means white shell water place. Thousands of years ago, it was a center place for the communities of Northern and Southern Tewa. We acknowledge that this place is also part of a much larger sovereign landscape for indigenous peoples, including the Hickoria Apache, the Diné or Navajo, Cochiti Taos and Hopi Pueblos. We acknowledge Spanish settlement occurred over four centuries ago and the push and pull of migration from every direction has brought new people, including people like myself to this place. Acknowledgement also requires holding both the beauty and the pain and supporting ongoing dialogue and story sharing, all of which reflect a vibrant and equitable community. We are the stewards of this land, of its water and air and of each other. We acknowledge the breath of those that came before us. So thank you, Anne-Marie, um, for discussing our mission. And we at, at the Santa Fe Art Institute, we fulfill our mission through supporting and amplifying dynamic creative practices that engage complex social issues. And we do that through primarily through thematic residencies and fellowships. We often host workshops um, and, and much of our work, especially recently has been involved in civic engagement and we do um, host interactive public events. And we are located as Daniel said on the Midtown site in Santa Fe which is a 64 acre site that is uh, used to be a university campus and um, is now owned by the city. And um, we are one of the few organizations still operating on the site. Um, as Santa Fe is witnessing increasing disparity, we know that if we are to bridge any inequities with future reuse of the site, um, us as an arts organization in our part of this, that we need to also look at the history of arts and culture here, including how arts has been a gentrifying force as a result of years of generations of actively promoting Santa Fe as an arts and tourist Mecca. And this is historically at least resulted in a very narrowly defined definition of Southwest art that has exoticized and appropriated misrepresented and commodified the local people, communities and cultures, right? Um, so, and that is true of many, many um, similar tourist areas, I'm sure. And things are certainly changing, um, but this is all feeling even more critical right now with the Zoom boom, which we are definitely experiencing here. I just read that as of this week, the average price of a home in Santa Fe, the average price has reached $560,000 and the average household income is $52,000. So we really are at a critical place, it feels, and it has been for some time. Um, so, so the Art Institute has been on the campus since the late 90s when what we call the Visual Arts Center, which is a total of four buildings, and we are in one of them, was built. These were all designed by Ricardo Lagareta, uh, and our building was specifically designed around our flagship residency program. So we can host up to 12 artists and creative practitioners each month who live on site. And because the closing of the campus in 2018 has so deeply impacted us and our future, that combined with our mission, we are very invested in the future of the district and its equitable development. And so these are some of the images from the rest of the Visual Arts Center buildings, which are quite beautiful. And, and also, uh, we are also adjacent to what, were, what used to be military barracks, used to treat soldiers returning from uh, World War II, including soldiers who survived the Bataan Death March. And these buildings are all currently empty. Um, 
And, and so as a way to imagine the future of the property, we have reimagined use of the remaining buildings around us, which is about 50,000 square feet and four acres of the total 64 acres that is under consideration for reuse and development. We are really trying to imagine ways that we hope that can positively reframe how we as a community value and support arts and culture here in Santa Fe. And so we've, we've really envisioned as a proposal to the city, a way to come together with a combination of partners, other nonprofits, uh, for-profits, educational institutions, uh, people who, who provide social services and also individual artists who to imagine ways that we can all come together to share the space that we're showing here, but also resources, right? To be in proximity when that's acceptable again and to work together to have a greater collective impact in our community. Our hope is that we can grow this vision into a strong community benefit that combines affordable space with interactive programming led by local artists, as well as strong connections to workforce development, you know, so that we can really imagine ways or the teenagers and young adults can imagine ways uh, to they can have a creative and, and healthy future and also just have places to explore and experiment and have fun. But we don't really see this as a real estate project primarily. We really see this as a way to go beyond shared space to bridge the gaps that we see in the community. And this is why we applied for and received a highly competitive, as most of you know, NEA R-Town grant so that we could focus on community cultural assets and site activations, starting with a focus on the immediate neighborhoods and listening to residents tell stories about their streets, their families, their yards, their businesses. And again, going back to what both Deborah and, and Daniel have said, their memories of the community. In working with our team, which includes uh, community liaisons, Dr. Alicia Guzman, uh, Dr. Esteban Real Galvez, Chrissy Orr, UNM professors Tim Castillo and Andrea Poli, and another local arts nonprofit, Little Globe. Uh, we have this amazing team and we've worked really hard during the pandemic on, on ways to connect. And so we developed the Six Degrees of Connection project, which is a way that people can provide stories, whether it's visual or audio um, or, or video or any way that poems, uh, favorite objects, um, and we've created this website, cultureconnects.site, that can hold many of these stories. Um, we really hope to develop this into a community archive where these can remain accessible to the public. And our Story Maps fellows at SFEI, Diego Medina and Christian Gehring, worked very closely with Dr. Rael Galvez to bring his land acknowledgement, uh, uh, just a brief part of which I read to you earlier, bring that to visual life through the Recentering Santa Fe series, really focusing on stewardship and community. Um, and they developed this really gorgeous coloring book um, that kind of brings you through the land acknowledgement in a beautiful way. And that was distributed to over 250 families last year. They're also um, doing a mural project as well that will continue this spring. Um, and then I invited Diego, Christian, and Alicia to deepen this work further by producing um, the Tilt Unsettled series as part of our SFAI Tilt podcast. And this is a way to deeply investigate and interrogate the culture, cultural identities and histories of this land and its many people, um, just as almost everywhere it seems in the United States and, and the world it, are facing a reckoning with not acknowledging our histories and the complexities and the atrocities um, that continue to, to, to surface deeply disturbing ways today, um, you know, whose voices are, are heard, whose voices are celebrated? How do we start to bridge this cultural divide that we are finding ourselves more and more in? Um, and so I really invite all of you to listen to this. this they've, they've produced this amazing series um, that I think connects um, to a, a lot of what we're all doing around the country. And so we will be planning more site activations with uh, local artists and our team this year um, that can really continue to demonstrate how this site can be a vibrant, active place 
um, and that holds our community values and bridges us together, brings us together, we've learned so much already and we will continue to learn so much from this multiplicity of voices. Um, and, and I think how all this weaves together will be a bit complex, but our hope is that this can um, be an early start project for the overall site that helps to ground us in a path forward based on that stewardship and community through the lens of arts and culture. And so you can see that, you know, we are deep in the thick of it. And, um, and so uh, that's where my perspective is, but I'm so grateful to be on this panel. I'm sure that I will learn a tremendous amount today. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. So Kara, would you like to um, share some of your thoughts given your role at the city of Boston? Sure, thank you. Yeah, I'm um, excited to hear even more detail about all of these projects. I have like a running list of questions um, because they're all fascinating and amazing. Um, and I think there's a lot to consider here as we think about Boston. Um, and I think maybe it'll help to hear a little bit of context about where we are right now. Um, you know, we're actually still on the younger side when we look at the track record of cities around the country that have significant investment in arts and culture. So the city released its first cultural plan, Boston Creates, in 2016, after a year and a half of community process, embedded artists, stakeholder meetings, town halls, uh, digital engagement, they reached thousands of residents. And now the mayor's office of arts and culture is a, a $2 million office with a staff of 15 people, access to millions in capital funds for public art. And our funding goes directly into the hands of our artists and our smallest organizations. Um, and we've also done what I think everybody talked about today, which is really embedding arts and culture into um, city work or, or placemaking or city building. That's been critical when it comes to community development and city planning in Boston. You know, we also have a high rent city where it's expensive to live and to build and the pace of displacement and neighborhood change is felt um, super acutely, right? So we're always arguing for the role of creativity and artists and city work. Um, and even within the market that we're in, we've been able to have some successes by embedding cultural planning, you know, whether that's to negotiate for affordable artists of work housing, um, you know, new performing arts facilities, even some neighborhood arts galleries, kind of affordable commercial space, um, as well as working to leverage city assets to create some new partnerships, um, including one where the city's actually uh, acquired some land and partnered with the community land trust, really doing some different things to think about um, how we, how cultural space can really anchor uh, development and affordable housing, um, which we've also heard a little bit about um, in one of the presentations. So there's definitely been some traction in, in Boston, but there's still a lot of questions. And I think some of the presentations touched on um, questions that uh, are really critical for us as we think about what it will take or what it looks like to do more ambitious cultural work in our city. Um, the first for me is what is the infrastructure that we really need in order to do this work well? Um, and I think infrastructure, both in terms of mechanisms and tools to do things like land acquisition or make kind of big deals and, and bring people into the room, um, but also infrastructure in terms of shared values and practices and collaborations. I think everyone who presented today talked about memory and land um, and what would it really look like or what would it take for us to approach um, Boston projects and planning with that deep history, including indigenous history and cultural practices. Um, and the second is that, you know, we're experiencing a really huge cultural shift in Boston right now. We have new leadership in philanthropy and our arts organizations, um, even at the mayoral level, our new mayor, Kim Janey, is the first woman and black mayor of the city of Boston. So what is our opportunity right now to think about Boston's culture writ large? Um, what does it look like operationally to adopt uh, a kind of like a nothing about us without us approach in projects that often really are started as closed close room deals, people being locked in the hotel room until they figure it out. Um, so how do we embed that cultural practice into the everyday of planning um, and city building work, especially when we know that the pipeline of operators, the people and organizations that are really gonna breathe life into these places um, and really build relationships with communities, they need equitable on-ramps and support in order to be able to take advantage of, of these opportunities in a sustainable way. So I think that's some of what, um, is sticking with me listening to these presentations. And I think we have a, a lot to learn and, and talk about. <laughs> so I'm excited to keep going. And I think now I'm passing it to Amari. 
Thank you, Carrie. You said everything that I, I, I need to say, so I, I don't think there's anything left except the Ted Landsmark um, singing part of this presentation. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm dead, dead serious trying to get Ted to sing. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think what was uh, remarkable about all the presentations, I, I felt um, it was a homecoming and I was being welcomed into uh, a family of art activists who are thinking uh, along the line, same lines to um, center the arts in this current anti-racist uh, inclusion discourse that's occurring across the country. And I think especially in uh, major city centers. And so when, when Kara talks about, Kara talks about Boston, uh, 2020 was a was quite a, a year for us, but you know I, I oftentimes thought about 1620 and it being the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower um, um, and and the first Thanksgiving, and so this history of displacement, um, you know, Boston to a certain extent is is ground zero for our, our country's history of displacing different different groups and including indigenous folks across the country and especially as we're having conversations around how do we acknowledge our past I, I was drawing um, influences from all of the presentations from Sankofa really looking back to bring us forward and taking the very best of of who we are and, and carrying carrying them forward in this post pandemic world um, that we are um, entering and so as an organization in Boston that is centering um, Dr. Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King uh, and their time here in Boston, I'm, I'm oftentimes thinking uh, about the Black church uh, and the importance of, of churches as art institutions and places of learning. And so the, the, the Black church being, for, for many Black folks in the past, a place where we got our intellectual stimulation, uh, we got our moral development, uh, and we were engaging in the arts every single week. And so this idea of who a whole person was, was about the intellect, was about uh, moral development in arts through song or instrumentation or musicality uh, that occurred in churches. And I think to a certain extent, all of us are uh, engaging in, in that same discourse, and especially you know, in, in Deborah's presentation, you, you saw that intimately involved and, and integrated in every single way. And I think, um, the idea of uh, engaging all three parts of our, our humanity into this new new world that we're entering in feels like an important piece that our institutions uh, have a responsibility to make sure that it's uh, front and center. And, and I think the other thing that I was reflecting on um, was this idea of well-being. And so we, we have also in Boston engaged a memorial into a research center into a festival and centering well-being and spatial justice, which is also a theme that has that resonated through um, all four of the presentations, this idea of, of safety uh, and joy, right? And so these two emergent tropes that have um, been illuminated during this time, spatial justice, right? So where can brown and black bodies be safe? You know, maybe not at traffic stops, maybe not at homes through redlining and gentrification. So this idea of spatial justice and the arts being uh, an igniter of that conversation, that discourse. Uh, and then well-being, the other trope that has emerged is Karen, right? Karen being upset about brown people barbecuing or brown people bird watching. And so the idea of black joy being a threat. And so how do we reclaim joy, brown joy, um, feminine joy, um, other joys uh, as a part of this new world that we're embarking uh, post vaccine. And so those themes seem, and, and you know, maybe everyone knows each other, or we compared slides, but it just seemed like this natural synergy of ideas that has uh, developed across our country in, in three, uh, and including Boston, four distinct places. I think, you know, we're, we're a little bit further behind than others, but I think this, this idea of centering the arts um, in, as a part of this uh, inclusion discourse across the country. And so I'm excited to hear, hear more and, and continue the conversation. I, I would very much like it if uh, you folks would ask each other the questions that uh, you'd like to have answered because um, each each city is in a somewhat different place. I've had the privilege of uh, visiting all of these locations um, over the years um, and they're all destinations um, in their own ways uh, that have uh, brought about a certain amount of economic development to areas that didn't exist 
uh, before. Certainly that was the case in uh, San Francisco. And I think the uh, Legoretta buildings in, in Santa Fe stood out um, from uh, the rest of the architecture in a way where anyone who was involved with design wanted to go to see those buildings because they were so uh, spectacular. But the issues underlying um, why there has been a, a disenfranchisement uh, of, of uh, peoples of color um, in, in terms of their contributions to the local area is a longstanding one. Um, so what, what was the leadership that was needed in order to bring to the fore uh, a commitment of finances and time and space um, to, to change that culture um, in, in San Francisco or, or in Santa Fe, um, or as we're starting to see it even in Boston. And what do you really need to coalesce uh, these kinds of ideas? Why did Moscone decide to move forward in San Francisco, for example? I'll take that cue. Um, yeah, I think there's so many interesting questions. Uh, that I would want to ask um, as well, and you know, as as we listen, it feels to me like there's something about a particular moment in time when you know a city or leadership in the city determines that there is an opportunity. Um, and I think what what uh, might have catapulted, though I wasn't there at the time, um, moving from this struggle that was very rooted in displacement and. Um, by the time the Yerba Gardens opened in 1993, several of the folks that had signed on to lawsuits had passed away. Um, and so, you know, important to understand that what came out was beautiful. And what, what um, I think what allowed it to come out was a community um, sort of cross sector, cross interest collaboration, like a willingness to roll up the sleeves and wrestle with this thing and figure out how we could do the best we could do to move it forward. I think that's one piece of it is, is that the decision was to move forward. Therefore, who do we need at the table in order to do that? Um, the other piece of it that I think is really fascinating and you see it in Jamie's work as well is that um, the commitment, you know, certainly for YBCA as a key player in this overall set of amenities is that that um, transformation is ongoing, and um, th that what we have to make sure of is that the history of the founding of the organization and the organization itself is visible, and that the work of kind of acknowledgement and reparation is ongoing. Right. So when I brought up um, Alice Shepard as an example, it's it's this idea of we don't invite you in to transform us for a minute. And like for us to call, you know, a, a community in for a minute, we invite you and we center you and we create the conditions for you to help us change. Because if we're going to change society or have an impact on society, we as an organization have to change and we also individually have to change. And so it's a really interesting kind of set of questions to think about as it relates to how the place around us is a part of that, because we don't exist. Like we're all talking about reopening right now. And, and what I have to keep focusing on is the most important thing we can do is contribute to the community around us. It isn't about us reopening and getting people inside. It's about how we assure that we reawaken better as a city than we were before. So, um, you know, that's a piece of it. And, and if there's time, Kara asked a really interesting question about um, the infrastructure and sort of how we can change the way we, you know, who we're including in the process of designing the future of our cities. And I think that could be an interesting way to go as well. Well, maybe you could respond to uh, uh, Kara's question there, because I think that's one uh, that everyone would, would like to hear an answer to. Well, I just was thinking, and this goes to the conversation I think that we had when we were all preparing for this, that, you know, in even in, in recent um, months during the pandemic, as was mentioned, you know, I'm a member of, or have been a member of uh, Governor Newsom's task force, also Mayor Breed's task force. And one of the things that I have found that is very useful is, A, there's a lot of data about the role that artists and arts organizations can play in advancing 
equity, health, and well-being in our communities. Um, and so being able to call on that data in order to influence our policy and our processes is really important. It was super helpful for me to be able to get his attention um, in this strange environment, which is mostly focused on private sector jobs and business to point to data about what we know, what we know that changed behavior in the Ebola crisis, what we know about artists and their role in saving lives when it comes to HIV AIDS, particularly in juvenile detention centers. So one piece of it was just that, like how do we help tell the story and how do we synthesize that story in a way that shifts policy and helps us to um, advance this work in our cities. The other piece of it goes to a project that we did um, with the San Francisco Planning Department several years ago now, um, which essentially once in a lifetime overhaul of Market Street, two mile stretch from the waterfront to the Civic Center. We were asking questions about who gets to design the future of the city. An enlightened bureaucrat in the planning department was really interested in playing around with civic engagement and trying to figure out how we move from top down planning to bottoms up planning. And so we designed a process called the Market Street Prototyping Festival, open call for ideas, we got hundreds in the first year. They came from some of the most well-known designers and you know, planners and other types in, this, in, the, in the world, and also from folks that had never done this kind of work before. And we juried it, we chose 50, we paired them all up with expertise. We um, then put out prototypes, experiments in the street. And we um, basically asked what will bring joy and inspiration? What do people need in the public realm? How do we connect these disconnected um, you know, districts across this kind of challenged thoroughfare? And the result was not only that we engaged millions of people um, and heard from them about what they wanted in their street, but we shifted the culture of planning in the city and we passed unanimously policy to make that kind of tactical urbanism easier. So I just say that to say something about like, that this is why YBCA wants to be a public square in a dynamic environment. It isn't about the finished product. It's about the experiments that we have to undertake as a society if we're going to make the change we want to make in the world. And the more that we socialize that change and experiment toward that change, the more people we get on board. How did you get the private sector decide to decide that uh, it, it was in their interest to participate? To, it, and, you and mean, I address that to all of you. How have you gotten the, the people with money who usually don't think about the arts, at least, you know, not as part of their investment strategy? Um, how did you get them engaged? I mean, I'll say something really quickly, but I've talked so much. So just to say that it, it's definitely in recent months, we've been really successful um, with uh, private sector individuals, particularly in the tech sector here who understand that the city needs to be reawakened, that we can't be su successful, they can't attract and retain talent, we can't do this work if we don't sort of um, address the state of the streets in San Francisco, the morale, like how, and that that brings them much easier to an understanding that art may be the answer. And so we've been quite successful. Um, and, and again, this kind of prototype experimentation is really of interest. It's, it's, it's an easier conversation to have to say, let us test something and let us understand if that something is right and it proves a concept that we can then embed in a more permanent way in the city's infrastructure. And we can't see Daniel, but I, I remind uh, folks that, that he's also on, um, on the line and I, I would love to have him weigh in on this, but let me ask uh, Imari and Jamie as well. How have you gotten uh, people from uh, local businesses and industry to, uh, to connect to the work that you're doing, which has such a huge public purpose? Well, to be clear, thank you, Ted. It, it's such an important question, but to be clear, we are just now embarking on this. So um, I think what's important for us is that we do make those connections. That's, you know, for so long, I feel as though the arts has been in its own silo that, you know, we all are so excited by exactly what Deborah said, thinking about it more of ex as experimenting and exploring, 
Um, rather than, you know, art is not just about going to the opera, it's not just about going to a museum. People are actually um, incredibly thirsty for a more immersive or interactive experience. Um, I don't know if any of you know um, the phenomenon Meow Wolf that is here in Santa Fe, but that is an example for, for you know, a wild success by an artist collective because they provided and continue to provide in other cities this experience. And so I think that we're at a moment where we really need to be um, holding on to that and finding out what about that is so interesting to people. Um, and at the same time, developing opportunities that, that broaden that conversation. Um, you know, for instance, in Santa Fe, there are a lot of very progressive um, people who, who consistently donate to political campaigns, let's say, and they wouldn't necessarily contribute to the arts, but we're starting to have these very interesting conversations because of our, um, we created a, a fellowship, the Story Maps Fellowship that I referenced earlier, that is about engaging local BIPOC artists in civic engagement with other partners like governmental agencies um, and, and other nonprofits that don't necessarily consider themselves arts organizations and having these conversations as peers so that you start to stretch beyond the boundaries perhaps of what each of you think you know or, or what institutionally is expected. And it's been a tremendous way for us to build those relationships with city departments, but also to, to really explore how creative so much of the city staff are and want to be and how how curious they are about how an artist can engage in that way right i also do think that it goes back to structural issues and we're at a moment where if you aren't seeing structural issues then you're not really trying to educate yourself <laughs> or listening at all to what's going on in the world and so that is a pretty exciting moment as well right and and so for instance what's happening here with housing and the momentum that i see the santa fe housing action coalition building is completely related to long-term grassroots campaigns that have been happening for many 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 years um, and starting to build traction and are not unrelated to the arts and are not unrelated to conversations around stability of families in order to, to have greater well-being um, and, and, and deeper impact through their creative lives. And you know, one very minor but, but um, significant thing, for instance, is also the fact that because the arts here uh, from a municipal perspective sprung from tourism, um, the majority of the funding um, for, for, for municipal funding for the arts is still embedded within the lodgers tax here. And so that is something again that is changing, but, but you know, um, those, are the, those are the reasons why therefore much of the art that's publicly funded here is funded in the tourist areas. Um, and so we're starting to see really beautiful connections between those kinds of issues and open space um, and also how, how people are tackling displacement. Um, you know, for instance, you know, I think we're all very concerned about opportunity zones. Um, uh, in particular, the Midtown site is an opportunity zone, but also a neighborhood just adjacent to it which is one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city is in an opportunity zone. And so I, I, I think that it's, it's really important that um, these are the conversations we're having with creative um, professionals and, and asking them how to start telling these stories in, in beautiful ways that can keep us all connected with many divided opinions. Um, and so, and so I think that it's just also the moment where we're all starting to finally see some of these things come together. You know, all, all three of these are uh, uh, cities that are uh, very attractive um, and have um, uh, attracted uh, uh, growing populations. At least I know that's the case for uh, Boston in a significant way and has been the case in San Francisco. And yet all of that 
um, cash flow into the city um, has also exposed the huge disparities that exist uh, between uh, the people who've been living there and the people who are arriving. How do you see your work um, in, in each of these cities uh, beginning to uh, close that gap? I want to bring, if I could, Daniel into this because we, we were starting a really interesting conversation around tech. So, so what happens here is, I think it happens in many places, is that um, you know, a lot of our uh, industry leaders or government leaders kind of use this big word like, let's focus on tech. <laughs> and you know, we, we, <laughs> we are like adjacent to Los Alamos National Labs and Sandia Labs. And so there is quite a, like amazing, brilliant thinkers in technology but, but to me, and, and I think I'd love to, Daniel to pipe in here, it's like, what are we really saying? Are we trying to recreate the Silicon Valley, which obvious, or the research triangle in North Carolina? Obviously that is not going to necessarily positively impact our local um, high school students uh, knowing where to go, our, our local you know, UNM graduates and getting jobs. And so how do we define this in a way that's, that's not just bringing in um, more uh, workers, which of course does help the economy, but how do we make sure that it addresses those disparities that you were talking about, Ted? Yeah, Jamie, th thanks for bringing that up. And, and Ted, I apologize for not having my video on. <clears throat> I had surgery yesterday and I'm looking really poorly right now with them. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I, I thought it's best not to have my video on, so I apologize. These things uh, happen. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. um, but I do want to say that, you know, part of going back to Kara's question too, as well as what Jamie was bringing up, is establishing the infrastructure for these things to happen and getting early agreement between the major stakeholders and, uh, and government to say, this is, we want to establish the ground rules for how we will manage these kinds of development, whether it's technology and or residential development. And you know my experience, with, particularly when I was working for the um, the, the HPD Housing Preservation De um, and Development Department in New York City, you know we were working in communities way out in Queens in the Bronx, where there was quickly encroaching uh, markets um, that were affecting their housing prices. And one of the problem, one of the things we were trying to do is get ahead of that wave. So we established the zoning, for example, for inclusionary zoning, so that any residential development that happens has to have some levels of affordability. And then the discussions at the community level was affordable for whom? So that we could you know, really tweak the policy to match what was actually needed in that neighborhood. But it takes that, that early intervention. So Jamie's right, we're talking a lot about in San Francisco about the entrepreneurialism around technology, but is it imported? Um, and or is it, do we begin creating the infrastructure, meaning the training systems, getting internships, requiring internships for new companies that come in, et cetera, and training programs. And this is stuff we can do now. It just takes the momentum and the shared language and the shared agreement. Somehow, you know, one of the things I would do when I would sit in New York meetings uh, with the community, it's like, if we were a different political system, we could do something different. But the reality is, is that we all vote for, you know, we all, we will function in a capitalist system. And we all vote for policies that promote that in some ways that we don't always know. So we're sometimes fighting with ourselves. And, uh, you know, so again, what I try to do with communities is to try to set that infrastructure before it gets so overwhelming that you've lost that opportunity to, in, you know, the, to in, interject the policies that government can do to manage these kinds of, um, you know, just wholesale gentrification and displacement. Um, so, Cars, you, you know, your question about infrastructure is really important about getting the systems in place now before your artists are gone. <laughs> so, what kinds of housing policies for artists might there be? Um, you know, affordable commercial space for artists so that they can stay in neighborhoods and communities where they're thriving right now, but are they are full of displacement because commercial prices will go up again at some point. Um, but being able to set those policies now when the risks are still lower before it's all of a sudden that they're just gone. Um, yeah. The other one, the, the last thing too, you know, one of the things in San Francisco um, that, that Santa Fe does not have is 
the, you know, I, I, I've done some work there with the real estate department, which helps the, you know, the, 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 the arts department the, uh, do real estate work. So the arts commission is, you know, they're, they're focused on program uh, mostly. Um, they're interested in securing space, but they rely on the real estate department to help them through the real estate process, which has been really helpful in um, doing a lot of the work at Yeverbrunn Gardens, for example, and, and a lot of museums that are located around that. That area. So anyway, that relationship is also an important infrastructure piece as well. You know, President Biden has uh, announced um, his intention to uh, uh, look for um, the United States, basically, to fund a lot of infrastructure investment um, and uh, enhancement over the coming years, including uh, internet and the like. But I don't remember offhand seeing the arts included as part of that infrastructure investment. And so I'm very curious because in, in uh, each of the cases that you've talked about, real estate is involved, opportunity zones might be involved, uh, physical improvements are involved. And I wonder um, how the arts um, and, and cultural enhancement might be included uh, as a part of, of this effort to invest in infrastructure. And I'll start with Deborah because um, I know she has to sign off soon, um, but also because your project was one that started with parking lots and, and created something very special in the middle of downtown. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the question. And, and um, I, you know, I am also the co-chair of something called the San Francisco Arts Alliance. And uh, this, uh, is an organization that has been incredibly active at the state, the local, state, and federal level in terms of arts advocacy throughout, before the pandemic, throughout the pandemic. We've worked very closely um, with Speaker Pelosi, with, you know, the Schumer, all of, so we've been at the table and to assure that the arts are included in um, the ARP, in upcoming stimulus, in infrastructure work. Um, and I think, you know, everyone here has probably been engaged in this, um, in this work. And so uh, th there, I, there is a couple things that I think are of interest. And one of them is that there's, there's increased interest in how to integrate the arts into the national agenda, how to move away from a siloed sort of national endowment for the arts, you know, agencies that are mostly grant making and have constituencies working on their own, but rather to have um, uh, arts leadership somehow in the executive office of the president that would oversee and help integrate, you know, the Institute of Museum and Li Library Science, you know, the, the um, NEA, the, uh, all of this kind of stuff, but also really make sure that the arts are in integrated into transportation, into climate justice work. Um, because again, we know that the arts can be essential to all of these things. And so one of the pieces of advocacy that we're doing is looking at where we might, I mean, in, the, in this case, which is interesting, San Francisco, um, California and Boston with um, Marty Walsh and now our labor secretary, Julie Sue, moving to work with Marty Walsh, we have a really big opportunity with people we know, I've worked closely with Julie over the past year, with people we know to talk with them about how to integrate the arts into workforce development, how to think about career pathway programs, right? So. I think there's a lot of work to be done, but I think it's a combination of both policy and structure, like how do we get the structure right so that we have a national agenda for the arts and that the arts are integrated into the national agenda. Um, but how do we also go for, um, you know, the, the low hanging fruit, the people we know and the people that have um, already some interest in the role that art can play in the work that they're doing. I have a question related to that, Deborah. Um, you must know Arlene Goldbard um, and she's become a, a good friend here. She lives in Santa Fe now. And, you know, she's been really um, trying to push this idea of, uh, you know, artist WPA. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of conversations about like, what's the WPA for this century for now. Um, Arlene is also engaged in um, a conversation with a group of people that are really lifting up the CETA program from the 1970s um, as well. And, you know, in California, as, as I mentioned, when I was able to get Governor Newsom's attention, 
um, you know, what I was advocating for is a California Creative Corps. And um, this would be a pilot of a program that employs underemployed artists uh, in service of um, infrastructure and spreading health messages and health and well-being in communities across the state of California. And he put $15 million in his budget um, this year for it. And it needs to be matched. So it will be a $30 million pilot program that we'll execute um, over the next probably year and a half or two years. We were able to pilot a version of that with Mayor Breed here called the San Francisco Creative Corps as well. And so I, you know, I think that um, that's one angle, right? A, a way of thinking about those artists that are interested in either reskilling or deploying their current skills in service of this recovery. Um, and it's one path. And I think, you know, there are many. One of the things that I found really interesting about this is it's not only that the policymakers seem to understand that artists in their own communities on the ground would probably be the best communicators of, you know, of health messages would be the ones that could build the cohesion, create the trust, bring people together. Um, but they also under, seem to understand that art, we need to capture this moment. And we can do that through art, a federal theater project. You know, there was a federal writers project. Um, we all know what the WPA PA murals did and also didn't do to capture the moment. And so I think that's really interesting as well, that we need to capture our times, that we need to understand the narrative that artists are essential to telling the story of who we are and who we wanna be. So in effect, among other things, we're looking for the Diego Rivera of our times to <laughs> document uh, labor struggles and to um, uh, speak to the challenges that uh, many Americans have faced uh, in, in the face of COVID. Deborah, I know you have to go, so thank you for, thank uh, you. for participating. Um, and, and we'll be in touch uh, over time, I'm sure. Let me ask the, the folks from uh, Boston who have built uh, educational programming and internships into um, your art investments in Boston. Could you elaborate a little bit on um, what it means to bring uh, forward a, a new group of artists uh, in a way, for example, that might benefit from having uh, a local WPA-like program to uh, nurture the arts as part of infrastructure? Well, um, I, I, will, I do want to say that the WPA conversation um, has been a really interesting one around the country. We've also been a part of, of some of the um, thinking about how to do that at the local level. And I think we do have traction to think about what it means to integrate artists into Boston's recovery and to do that in a way that is focused on um, working with artists in the communities that have been hardest hit by COVID-19 and to really think about equity through that public health lens um, as, the, um, as the way to really think about where those resources go and um, who's getting hired with those funds. So we do have some traction in that conversation, which is really exciting. And I think, you know, it, one of the challenges is that we don't just want to have artists decorating the infrastructure, right? We want to have artists really embedded in what those processes are, whether that's community engagement or actually thinking about policy directly or, um, you know, helping to think about what an equity approach to some of those investments does look like. So I think that's been one of the, the challenges as we're having those conversations is that there's a lot of demand for, you know, the mural, which is great. And we like having a lot of demand for that. But I think how we, um, how we work with the, um, someone used the word um, like friendly bureaucrats or enlightened bureaucrats, how we work with with those allies in different city departments to um, build kind of deeper opportunities for artists is a, a big question for us. And I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, but maybe Amari, do you wanna um, take a pass at this one? Yeah, yeah. you know, I think, I think it, you know, what's happening in Boston and, and I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm feeling overly optimistic today. And, you know, I, I think, you know, it feels like we're in the midst of a of a third reconstruction in Boston, particularly around the emergence of our black elected leaders, and most recently the the swearing in of our new mayor. And so, our, our congresswoman, you know, emerging on a on a national level, all of our top law enforcement officials, and so you know, thinking about reconstructions, uh, you know, th these three stages 
one is civic and legislative, the other is economic, and then the last is social and civic. And so I think this the social part of the reconstruction feels emerging in, in Boston. Um, and you know, as an organization that is building a monument um, and, and thinking about public art, I feel like we're we're in a different and a unique position. Um, the the daughters of the American Confederacy built 425 monuments in the 1920s to be symbols and markers of what uh, I mean. Essentially, they were signs for cities to say that who was welcome and who was not welcomed. And so, what does it mean for this particular piece of public art in America's oldest country uh, that is three stories high? Uh, what does it say about a city? Uh, and then what does it say um, around spaces and whose spaces matters and whose spaces don't? In Boston, there are currently only eight entertainment licenses owned by people of color in, in the city. There's two types of entertainment licenses. One are these, the general ones that you want to get, and then there's neighborhood ones. And so the, the big, the big uh, daddy of them all, the, the, the general ones, are own, there's only eight owned by people of color. And so when we talk about spatial justice, where does art belong? We're also having conversations around entertainment licenses. So where does art exist? Where does people's ability to uh, practice well-being as a form of art? Not all art is permanent. Not all art is a mural. Uh, not all art is uh, stationary. Um, and how do we move beyond stone and steel when we talk about monuments or buildings? When we talk about art galleries, you know, what are spaces of activation? I think all of us were, were talking about that to a certain extent. And so I think Boston through an arts conversation is interrogating our housing, our transportation, um, our, our access to, to healthy food and nutrition, our educational ecosystem, um, all through an, an arts lens. And I think it's, it's resonated with people. You asked who was supporting this. Uh, Ted, we, we, this, was, this started off a year ago as a $12 million campaign for King Boston. Uh, we're we're 13.5 million in a 12 million campaign. Um, 10 of that was raised since July of 2020. Boston is engaged in this arts conversation. Um, Boston is engaged in a social justice conversation. And the intersection of that um, has allowed folks who were not interested in the arts to, to give to an organization like King Boston and folks who uh, were interested in the arts to give to an organization interested in spatial justice. And so uh, I, I think this is some, you, you know, a unique happening in our city. Um, and, you know, I think um, it's just exciting to be, to be a part of it. And I think, you know, it's, there's this reputation of Boston, you know, just even this Saturday on Saturday Night Live, uh, Daniel Kalua talks about the, the, the most racist places outside of Britain, Australia, South Africa, and Boston. And so this, this, this strange relationship um, that the country has with our reputation is, is something that I think, um, Bostonians are taken to task. And I think, you know, we know that that's not our reputation. We're a city that's 25% Black, 51% uh, BIPOC. Um, and we have a lot of challenges that we have to make up um, and, and fix. And so I think this, that's the moment in time that we're in. And, and it feels like the arts are at the center of it. You know, you, you've um, addressed, I think, uh, rather directly one of the questions that's come in, and that is that um, we've, we've talked a lot about design and building of phys physical and economic uh, spaces and, and building communities around physical infrastructure. Um, but could you further elaborate on what artists and art, art, arts organizations can do um, in regards to the dimension of building communities, uh, not just uh, physical spaces, but uh, really creating a sense of, of uh, positive community uh, cohesion. Well, you know, I think, and, I mean, this is um, top of our, our mind. Um, you know, we're, we're, wa we're watching on TV um, racism on trial. So uh, it looks like Derek Chauvin, but what we're really watching is racism on trial. We're, we're watching uh, through the, the police testimony um, if community policing, which we've advocated for in this moment in time on trial, we've watched through through the trial um, substance um, substance use disorder be on trial, and whether that's cr can be or should be criminalized. We've watched through the testimony of the young people, trauma being on trial, and the impact of poverty and racism. 
And so that's what we're in the middle of. And so for an arts organization like ours, one of the things that we, one of the ways that we've activated uh, and really starting with um, the election is a fund called the Forward Fund. And so we are deploying funds to grassroots organizations to address racialized trauma through the arts and engagement and social connectivity as, as also an art. Social connectivity is an art, right? And so when I talked about the black church uh, being the center of both our intellectual stimulation, our moral stimulation with social connectivity being at the center of it and also our artistic stimulation. I think being an organization named after the Kings, you know, you know, there's a, uh, an, an increased emphasis. And so that's one of the ways that we're doing it. So the Forward Fund in Boston is a fund that is that was created to address racial um, catastrophes, which may happen if, um, if racism is found not guilty um, in this country in 2022. Social unrest may happen in our city. And so the Forward Fund and through our grant making is one of the ways that we're we're, we're, we're addressing it in Boston. And that's the Forward Fund is a coalition of 30 other organizations um, many of them are other art organizations that is engaged in funding other organizations to to do this work of um, social connectivity. And so I think that's, you know, that's one way, but, I, but I'll stop talking and um, give someone else uh, an opportunity. Well, I have one last question that, that goes uh, again to the question of funding and, and who pays for all of this. Um, is there a legacy of the... Um, old 1% set aside for the arts. Is it, was that program responsible for in, in any way actually marginalizing uh, the role of the arts um, in uh, development processes? And if you don't have a 1% set aside for the arts, um, how do you persuade people um, who wouldn't otherwise invest in the arts um, that uh, funding should be allocated from both the private and the public sectors uh, to underwrite the costs of um, what the arts do to build communities. I'll jump in, but I'd love to hear Kara and, and, and Mari and Daniel. I, you know, I think that um, my personal opinion is that any set aside, right, can be abused <laughs> um, uh, just by the nature of a set aside. Um, but I would, I would say that I, I don't agree that, that it might have marginalized the role of the arts. I feel like the classist and racist and patriarchal mm. um, you know, systems by which um, that, that arts have been funded, at least in the last century, has marginalized the role of the arts. And, and that, that's why this is a very exciting time that we can start to acknowledge that and redress that and, and, and really develop new opportunities that don't abide by, um, by those very old and unfair systems. But, you know, that is, you know, they've, marg they've marginalized themselves, right? And that's why we do see a crisis in many institutions with people not understanding why they should even participate because it doesn't reflect who they are, it doesn't reflect their culture or communities or the way that they practice art and culture themselves in their lives. And so, um, yeah, I think that would be my first uh, response to that. I would just add, you know, one of the biggest investments coming out of the cultural plan in Boston was a percent for art program, uh, city funded. And I think that one of the ways that it gets um, maybe affirm some of what you're talking about, Jamie, in, in people's um, understandings of what arts and culture is, is that it makes people think that it is this kind of like applied thing that you, you have a whole process, you have a whole investment, and then at the end, you can put art on it. Um, and that that somehow is, is a full benefit to the community or is a significant contribution to the arts. And I think um, we see this a lot in um, like art washing from private development that says, oh, our, you know, here's our big community, um, you know, give back is going to be this piece of art at the end. Um, and we're on the verge of in a, a couple of neighborhoods in particular, um, not accepting that uh, as a policy, um, as a kind of community benefit, because it's not, um, not what the community is asking for either in the arts or the community at large in those areas. Um, but I think also a lot in Boston, um, you know, any new funding 
uh, source or program is in the broader context of what is the funding in the city of the in, uh, in the city of Boston for the arts. And there's a lot of scarcity, um, you know, feeling of scarcity, scarcity mentality because we don't have huge public funding for the arts in Boston. We don't have that um, amazing lodging tax that is maybe now frustrating, and I'm sure comes with all sorts of other problems, but is a source of of regular funding. So. I think that within that context, even the funding, um, which is the majority of, of the funding that we have to give out, we give to artists, especially low-income artists, BIPOC artists. Um, but you know, where do you go from that grant? Like, what's the next thing that you have access to? What's the pipeline? You know, what's your opportunity to grow and to, um, you know, not necessarily take the path of being an individual fine artist or a nonprofit, but actually a company, you know, or a startup or someone who's going to make money. You know, where's that that pathway for investment coming from? And so I think a lot of people, um, a lot of artists in particular in Boston will see a new this new funding approach of percent for art and say, OK, but what is that really doing for me overall if I can't really build a career and I don't have those steps? Um, and I think the same is true of some um, really well intentioned and also impactful other funds that we have access to. We just started. Um, a program called Radical Imagination for Racial Justice in partnership with the Mass College of Art and Design. Um, that's specifically a grant for BIPOC artists to imagine what racial justice looks like in and with their communities. Um, and the response was really amazing um, in terms of who, who felt like that was accessible to them. We had a long process, really community driven and community designed process for um, getting those funds out and for designing the program. And at the same time, there's a lot of healthy conversation and criticism about why does this have to be about racial justice? <laughs> Why can't we have funding in Boston that's for BIPOC artists that's just for BIPOC artists to do what it is that they're doing? You know, why does it have to come with these additional conditions? And so I think kind of every, every step that we take as a public agency is within this context of the greater scarcity of support, um, particularly equitable support for arts and culture. So do any of our presenters have a final comment that they, uh, would want to make to uh, all of our participants? Well, I, I haven't spoken too much because the questions have been mostly focused on the arts and cultural organizations, which I really appreciate. I, I think, you know, just coming from a developer perspective, um, one, the 1%, you know, get, putting the 1% art fee into the budget is just, once it becomes performance, it becomes performance, what you put in. I, I, I And after working at, again, at the HPD in New York, the Housing Department in New York, we always had this mentality of it's not about and or it's not about or it's about and so do the one percent and do other stuff um it, it doesn't mean that you're eliminating other options from it it's just because it could get abused or not abused but i would say just at the forefront put in the parameters upon which you want to you know spend those funds whether a certain amount of the allocation goes to you know some particular population program, whatever, so that it's clear to the public how these funds are getting used and its purpose. Um, developers don't mind it. They Once they know that they have to do it, they, they, developers want certainty. Um, so once they know that they have to do it, they have to do it. Um, I, 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 I do want to say that you know no, no development in this world anymore is private. It's all public, especially when you're developing at scale. And artists, and when, when I'm working with artists on, uh, you know, in the pre-development process, they bring a perspective that no planner or architect can bring to the table. Would typically sound dry and boring. Deborah brought up some great examples of, you know, testing, prototyping, asking questions about the experience that people want to have. If they can't draw, if they don't know how high a curb should be. They don't have to. They can describe the, their 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 the experience they want in a physical sense. But also, Ted, what you were talking about earlier, policy that creates community. Whether it's about affordability in housing, affordability in commercial space, job job uh, access, etc., um, those are things that strengthen communities, um, and that stuff they can talk about. And an artists can help ways uh, to facilitate conversations that I don't think anyone else can in the same way that artists. It's, it, they don't bring that same level of tension that the planner does or the architect does. So anyway, uh, my my small contribution there. Well, thank you. And I think that's an important contribution. I want to thank all of our presenters. Um, and let me uh, turn this back over to Anne-Marie. Thank you, Ted. And thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, just the process of creating this 
session was a creative process in and of itself that was just really wonderful and I want to thank uh, Kara for being for uh, joining me in several conversations to think this through and and many people who on this call and not on this call were a part of it, it it's an honor to, to know all of you and have a chance to work with all of you. Uh, this session touched upon many themes that have been bubbling up over the course of this 14 week series, we have two more to go. So I encourage uh, all of you who are with us tonight to join us for the next two next week we will be going to Chicago where we will be joined by uh, Maurice Cox, the Commissioner of Planning for the City of Chicago, and Tanika, um, who is, uh, um, excuse me, Tanika Lewis Johnson, who's the creator of the Folded Map Project. And they're gonna talk about how we really think about planning for equity across cities and how we engage people in thinking about the disparities that exist in our cities, as well as opportunities to come together for conversation. So I encourage you to join us. Also, this session has been recorded. It will be available on both the Myra Craft website and our Rudy Bruner Award website, which will also include links to resources like the case study about Yerba Buena Gardens if you'd like to learn more about it. So thank you, everybody, and we hope to see you next week. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Thank you.